God wants you to experience more than what you've ever seen, more than you've ever imagined, more than you've ever heard. The Holy Spirit wants to put a God idea in your life and He wants to enlarge your capacity so that you can experience that in reality. Amen. Faith is not for the natural. Faith is not for the same old, same old, the mundane, the boring, the, the small. Faith is about connecting your life with God's bigness. Come on, faith is what takes you from the natural to the supernatural. From living by the strength of your hands to experiencing God's hand coming upon you where you can live a blessed life. Well, today we're continuing our series on faith. Uh, August, what we preached on a month of miracles, and then last month we started to teach on faith. And you know, it seems to be really resonating, and a lot of people are just kind of, man, I've never heard this, so we're going to keep going. And uh, this week, today, I want to talk to you about the levels of faith. And uh, the good news is, is that, you know, we're going to talk about several different levels this morning, but you're always growing in one area or another in faith in different parts of your life. For example, you know, one of the first things that God dealt with me was the area of finances. And so I learned to trust God. I had little faith. Well, I had no faith that God was my provider. And then I started to give and started to take God at his word. And I went from little faith. And now, you know, God takes you from faith to faith. Start to grow in that area. Come on, in the area of forgiveness, God can grow you. In the area of dreaming, what God wants to do in your life, how many know that God can do far much more of what you're experiencing right now? We were singing this song about, you know, God's plan and God's purposes. How, how many believe that God wants to enlarge your life? Four of you, great. The rest of you, you got no faith in that area. Well, that's, you're in the right service because I want you to know that God's, God wants you to experience more than what you've ever seen more than you've ever imagined, more than you've ever heard. The Holy Spirit wants to put a God idea in your life and he wants to enlarge your capacity so that you can experience that in reality. Amen. Faith is not for the natural. Faith is not for the same old, same old, the mundane, the boring, the, the small. Faith is about connecting your life with God's bigness. Come on. Faith is what takes you from the natural to the supernatural from living by the strength of your hands to experiencing God's hand coming upon you where you can live a blessed life. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you today. Everybody else, whatever, go back on your phones. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about, because we're all growing in these different areas. You can be growing in faith for the salvation of your family. Come on, for me, you know what? I'm growing in faith about what we're doing as a church, and I feel that God's Spirit is actually talking to us in, as a church, and I, I sense that God's inviting us to dream a little bit bigger. I'm sensing that God really wants us to multiply in every area. I really believe that we're just starting to scratch the surface of what's available for us if we will rise up in faith, Take God at his word, let the Holy Spirit impregnate us with a God-sized dream and vision, and if we will step out in faith, taking God at his word, I believe we're going to see more in this year than we've seen in previous years combined. Can I hear a good amen? So, I want you to have your ears open. Let God speak to you today about your situation. Maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's your business, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your parents, you know, and my kids excluded. And, uh, but maybe there's an area where you need God just to show up in a big way. So let's talk about faith. You know, it's interesting in Mark 16, verse 14, it says, later he appeared to the 11 and they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart. Whenever you see unbelief mentioned, it never has anything to do with the mind, it has to do with the heart. Unbelief is different from doubt. Doubt is an unfocused mind, but unbelief is a hardened heart. And the disciples had gotten to that place of unbelief where they had a hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. In other words, Jesus is rebuking them because they didn't believe the women. They were not listening to the women who had seen Jesus. Ladies, this is a good time you can elbow your husband and say, listen to me. Don't worry, we'll have a healing service for ribs after. <laughs> so, Jesus rebukes them because they did not believe. The whole mission of Jesus was getting these 12 dysfunctional disciples to start believing that Jesus was who he said he was, and he was always working on their faith. Matter of fact, in Luke 18, verse 8, it says, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? 
So what is it that Jesus is looking for? He's looking for faith. Come on. Faith is the foundation of every relationship. In other words, trust is the foundation of every relationship. And trust comes by knowing that person. God wants you to know him. He wants you to see him not through logic or reason or denominational or human tradition. He wants you to have firsthand revelation knowledge of who he is. He wants you to see that God is who he says that he is. That God can do what he says he can do and that God has what he says he has. Come on. That's why Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus that they would, he says, that you would receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of who he is. In other words, it's possible to have a partial knowledge, a limited knowledge, or an incorrect knowledge of who Jesus really is. And how you see God will determine what you're going to do with your life. If you see God as mean, as judgmental, you know, as holding a grudge and angry and, and, uh, you know, small spirited and stingy, then that's how you're going to live your life. But if you get a vision of who God is, that he is your good, good father, and he's got good plans for you, and where sin abounds, grace does much more abounds, and know that you are his idea, and that he wanted you before the foundation of the world, and dreamed a plan for you, you can experience and start to step out of your boat and experience what God has for you. But it's going to require trust. It's going to require, you're going to have to step out in faith. You're going to have to uh, you know, put your logic and your reason and your, your human experience and your past on the altar and take God at his word. Are you with me today? Yes. All right. So let's go. Let's start with uh, the beginning of, uh, uh, of little faith, right? Because without, it's impossible to please God. You know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, so you've got to, the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, for without faith, it's impossible to please him. So how are you going to please God? By your sacrifice? Self-denial? No, it's your faith. When you, when, when you look at God and take him at his word and you consider him faithful, that pleases God. And he that comes to God must believe that he's a rewarder. you got to know that God is a good God and the devil is a bad devil. And that is really good theology right there. It takes a theologian to mix it up. You know, when you hear someone teaching that God will put a sickness, a disease, a cancer on you to teach you something, that teaching is of the devil. That is false teaching. Good things come from God, bad things come from the devil. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Sickness, bad. Devil, bad. Jesus, good. Healing, good. That's good theology right there. Even in the Greek. So let's look at little faith, okay? So our faith is always growing. Let's start by looking at what is little faith. So our opening passage, which also is on the app, if you've on your, got your tablet, you know, have your Bible, turn to Matthew 14, open your tablet, follow along. Now, reading from verse 25. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. I tell you, sometimes God wants to come to you in different ways that you're not expecting. He always wants to reveal something more of his nature for you because he wants you to experience more that he has. So Jesus comes to them in an unusual way. It's never happened before. Sometimes God wants to meet you in an unusual way, in a way that he's never met you before. Because it's so easy for us to fall into a rut. We have our little expectation. And God says, no, I think I'm going to surprise you today because I, to, I want you to discover that I'm a whole lot more than you've ever even thought or imagined. Come on, this is so good. So he comes to them walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him, they responded with great faith saying, wow, look at you, Jesus. No, they said, ah, It's a ghost. (laughs) It's a spirit. Don't you love the disciples? Because it's like, you know the Bible's real. Like if somebody was going to make this stuff up, they would not paint themselves in the picture like a coward. And I was so afraid. I thought Jesus was a ghost. No, it's like, you know, they they would say, yes, and and all the disciples, we jumped out, started dancing with Jesus. You know, we were doing like break dancing on the waves. It was really cool. You should have been there. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, you know, because they cried out for fear. See, you're either, you're either going to be operating in fear or you're going to be operating in faith. 
Our bodies were not created to operate on fear. That's why we get sick and our immune system breaks down and we have all these anxieties and mental health issues. It's because we start operating in fear and God never designed it. You were designed to walk with God. You were designed to, you know, to talk with him, to live in his realm at his level, to connect with him. You were designed to walk with divine royalty in peace, in purity, in righteousness, in confidence. But when sin came in, shame came in. And all of a sudden, we start feeling unworthy. You know, I'm so glad that there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Mm. Amen. Let's keep going. And he said to him, Lord, and Peter, uh, and Jesus said, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. <laughs> well, I like that. Do not be afraid. It's Jesus. Whatever you're facing in your life today, do not be afraid because Jesus is greater. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it's you, I want to play. Command me to come to you on the water. What do you think the other disciples thought? Wait, wait, wait. Why are you going to do that? Peter, settle down. Behave. We're in church. Don't smile. You know. And Jesus said to him, come. <laughs> he didn't say, well, what is the purpose of this miracle? Is somebody going to be blessed? Is somebody going to be healed? Is it, you know, is, you know, it, it, no, it was like Peter wanted just to walk on water. I, I kind of love that. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Because we get the small picture that, you know, we got we to gotta clarify. We got we to gotta validate what if somebody gets, you know, healed by it, then I guess it's okay, that miracle. But what if God just wants to bless you because he just loves you? It's a good picture of God, isn't it? No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Come on. You want to, I want to prosper. I want to prosper. I want to have influence. I want to, come on, I want to be a giver. I want to rise up and be God's financial partner on the earth. Well, you know, you shouldn't pray that. You know, Peter said, I want to walk on water. Who, he's going to get arrogant. You know, I, I would have. <laughs> See the disciples, you were sinking. Thankfully, Jesus saved you. Well, I did at least three steps on water. How many steps have you guys done, you bunch of chickens? <laughs> I would have rubbed it in their faces, wouldn't you? Did you, you should have took a photo. Take a photo. Post it on Instagram. The first three steps. Nothing after that, you know. Don't get this one. You know, get this one. So Jesus has come, and Peter had come down out of the boat. Hmm. If you're going to live by faith, you've got to step out of your boat. If you stay in your boat, you're never going to experience walking on water. If you keep doing everything you've always done, listen, what's the, that old, you know, uh, proverb, the insanity proverb, if you keep doing everything you've always done, you know, you'll keep getting what you've always got. And so there's got to come a time in your life when you're going to step out in faith and believe God. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You know, it's so easy to stay in the boat because the boat can be your comfort zone. But you know what I realized? God doesn't care about my comfort. But he, he does care about my character development. And he wants us to be a people of faith that step out. Now let's keep going. Well, and Peter can come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. That's awesome. He stepped out of the boat. He's walking on the water. He's going towards Jesus. But notice what happens. As long as he's looking at Jesus, he, he's operating in the supernatural. He's experiencing something. And then it says here, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? All right, now this, this, so we're understanding what happened here was little faith. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. All right, so first of all, let's look at what little faith is. Because oftentimes, you know what, we, we start someplace and God wants our faith to grow in different areas. And it becomes like a muscle. We talked about this last week. The more you use your faith in those areas, the stronger that you get, right? I remember when we signed the first lease for a building to, as, a, as a church, and we were going to pay like $1,200 a month, and I, I was sweating bullets, and I thought, oh my goodness, where are we going to get $1,200 a month, you know? But you step out in faith, and it was fun, funny. Every time we took a step of faith to get into a building that we felt the payments were beyond us, it was like God would just meet us, and, and, and the generosity would go up, and, you know? And uh, it would just happen every time, every time. You know, when we bought land, and we were and renovating this, and so we, our payments were $40,000 a month, you know? I tell 
tell you, I was like, oh, what are we going to do for you? But now all of a sudden you get up there and it's like, man, it's awesome. Your, your faith grows because you realize God is faithful. And so we just keep growing. And so, you know, now the, the goal of my faith is not to get us further in debt. Uh, now, now my faith is about, come on, let's just eradicate that bill and let's keep putting that money into missions and to get this gospel out to one more person. But God wants to grow your faith and your confidence. So when I meet pastors say, oh, I'm thinking about getting a building. This is going to cost me $3,000 a month. I'm like, yeah, pisha, just do it. Piece of cake. It's a no-brainer. Just get it, you know. But my faith has grown because I've seen God's faithfulness and all that. But in every area, you're always, so don't beat yourself up if you're growing in faith in an area, and, and, and even if it's a little faith. So what is little faith? Well, this is what little faith is. Little faith is really a restless faith. It's a faith that says, I think, you know, I, I, you know, I, I know God can do this for me, but I don't know if he'll, I know God can, but I don't know if he'll do it for me. It's not being settled. This, this kind of little faith is, is characterized by a broken focus, right? Because what happened? So first of all, Peter wants to come out of, out of the boat. He wants to walk on water, but he's not just going to jump out on, in presumption. He's not just going to step out and do it because he wants to play. He needs to have a word from God, right? Because we don't go beyond what is written. So he says, Jesus, command me to come unto the water to you. I want to do this too, but I know I can't do it on my own. But if you say a word, I know that what's, what is sustaining you is going to sustain me. So Jesus said, come, one word. And Peter put his one step out and he put it on the C and his next foot step went on the O. His next step was on the M and the next step was on the E. He was walking on the command of Jesus. He was not walking in the water. He was walking on God's word. And let me tell you, God's word will sustain you in any area of your life. You can count on it. Yes, and it is absolutely, you know, supernatural beyond the realm of logic or reason. And so what happens is once he got his focus off of Jesus, he started to see the storm, he saw the waves, he heard the wind, and it was boisterous, and then he started to sink. Well, James says this in uh, chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So where does doubt live? Doubt lives in a divided mind, in an unstable mind, right? So little faith is when you're, uh, you know, and here it says in James, he says, don't let that man suppose that he will receive anything. So one of your greatest enemies is a broken focus. And what was the broken focus? It was when, when Peter got his eyes off Jesus and started to be influenced and intimidated by the circumstances that he saw with his eyes and he heard with his ears and he felt with his skin, right? Little faith is sense knowledge governed. It's, it's, it's letting this circumstance, what you feel in these five senses begin to influence you more than what God's word says. So little faith comes because you take your eyes off Jesus. You know what? Anytime you take your eyes off Jesus, you're going to start to struggle. You're going you're gonna to fall into reason. You're going to fall into, I don't know, but I tell you what I, I find for myself, that's why I need to read the Word of God every day. That's why I've got to pray every day. I've got to keep my eyes on Jesus because it's so easy to be influenced and intimidated by the circumstances around you. Come on, can I hear a good Amen. So that is what little faith is. So broken focus will always create instability and insecurity in every area of your life. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Listen, if you're walking by sight, you don't need to walk by faith. And if you walk by fight, if you walk by fight, yeah, if you walk by fight, you don't need sight. And uh, if you walk by faith, you don't need sight, right? So you've got to learn to be disciplined in your imagination. You've got to learn to focus your imagination, which is the same word as visioning, which is the same word as meditation. And so strong faith is built on meditation, imagination, visioneering on God's promises, keeping your eyes on Jesus and not on the circumstances. Because when you get broken focus and you got one part of your brain says, well, I, well Jesus told me to come, oh, but look at these waves. You know what? This is what God's word says. You know, some of you are in that battle when it comes to giving. I know what God says. I'm your provider. Come on, try me now in this. And then so you, you say, well, I don't know. Ah, God's word says to give, ah, but my bank account says this. Ah. And so you're double-minded. You're going to have to shut one of the voices off. You're either going to make a decision, I'm going to live in faith or I'm going to be dominated by fear. 
And God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The moment you give in to fear, you've lost the soundness of your mind as a believer. It's very logical to the unbeliever. Of course you ought to be afraid. The whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. Antichrist is coming as a one world government. You better build your Frady hole and get your, you know, doomsday prepper stuff in there and your guns for the zombie invasion. And you can, you can live in that fear. And that's unnatural, that's unnormal, and that's ungodly for a child of the king. We are not doomsday preppers. We are occupiers with a mandate to take this gospel to every nation and to build church. Because Jesus said, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All right, let's move on. Focus determines mastery. Anything that has the ability to keep your attention has mastered you. Peter got into little faith because he let the, the, the circumstances, the storm, master him. It got his attention off of Jesus. Only a focused faith can produce miracles. Your enemy is anyone or anything that breaks your focus. Okay, that's the first point, little faith. So little faith is centered on my letting my feelings and my emotions and my experience uh, get me off of my setting my mind. The Bible says, put your looking unto Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. So anything that tries to get your eyes off of Jesus is your enemy. All right, so that's number one. So that's little faith. Well, let's talk about the next level of faith. The next level of faith is growing faith. And uh, I want to give you a couple examples of how you can actually grow your faith. And so we're going to use the story of Abraham and uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 21. Is this helping anybody today? It says uh, in verse 18 in the NASB, in hope against hope. I tell you, I like that. I like in hope against hope. You know what? Even against all hope, you can be in hope. <laughs> you know, against, and you can be in all impossibility and adverse circumstances. I believe that God can turn your circumstance around. I believe that if you'll put your faith in God, whatever you're facing right now, God can turn it around. Mm. Because God puts no limits on faith, and faith takes the limits off of God. So then it goes on to say, so that he believed. Against, against all hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations, according to which was, had been spoken. So God had given a promise, so shall your descendants be. And without becoming weak in faith, so it's possible for you to get weak in faith. You know that you can neglect your faith? If you let sin and all kinds, you start living in disobedience, your faith can get weak. If you stop feeding your faith, your faith can get weak. And so it goes, on to, it goes on to say, not being weak in faith, and, you know, uh, he, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead. See, so you would, if you start contemplating the circumstances and start giving them attendance, uh, attention, let them have the authority in your life and the influence, you will weaken your faith. So you're either feeding your fears and, and, and starving your faith, or you're feeding your faith and starving your fears. And so you've got to learn to feed your faith. So Abraham, he didn't grow weak in faith by looking at his own body, which was 100 years old, or the deadness of Sarah's womb, who was now 90 years old. If he would have been logical and reasonable, well, God gave us a brain, you know. You don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. That is a lie. If you are heavenly minded, you will be the greatest earthly good. He says, yet with respect to the promise of God, He did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. Okay, how would you grow strong in faith, Abraham? Giving glory to God. Oh, I like that. And being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. So what what I've discovered is two ways to really get my faith growing. Number one is to live a life of praise. You know, I watch people when they come to church here on a Sunday morning, and uh, I I watch how people praise God, you know. And uh, listen, it's so easy to praise God in this environment. Come on. This environment is so easy because you're surrounded by a bunch of crazy fanatics, a bunch of people that love God, taking God at His Word, and with a band, they raise their hands. Well, why do I got to raise my hands? I don't know. God says to raise, raise up holy hands when we pray. He says to raise up hands when you praise Him. So I don't know. God likes it. So you know what? If God likes it, I'm going to do it that way. Madeline, you know what? There's certain things that she likes. She likes when I massage her feet. You know what? I don't like massaging feet. I think feet are gross. I think they're cringy. You know what? But uh, but I do that. Why? Because she likes it. So it's not about me. It's about her. And God says, I like it when my people open their mouth and sing loud songs and raise their hands. And so I like, so when we, I praise God. And then for me, I try to save my voice when I'm worshiping because I'm preaching three services. So I whistle. When you hear that person whistling, that's me. 
<laughs> Come on, and you're welcome to whistle, you know, because the Bible says make a joyful noise. I just want to be the loudest voice in here. I want God to make sure he hears me, so I whistle. <laughs> Take that. And, uh, you know, and so, but there's something about giving glory to God. There's something about why we come to church on time and praise God is because that's such a great part because that's how I grow my faith. Because I might have had a difficult week. I might have had horrible emails from some of you. Will you stop sending those emails? Actually, I don't get hardly any. I, most of the emails I get are actually really good. You know, they're just like people just saying, this is what Christ has done in my life. Thank you for this. So I got to be honest with you. A lot of the emails are fantastic. You get the old grumpy one, but that's good because, you know, that just fulfills prophecy. Yeah, Jesus says, whoa, whoa, when all men speak well of you, you know. And so that just kind of helps me. Oh, good, good. I'm not, I'm not a false prophet. Phew, somebody hates me. That's awesome. If they hated Jesus, they're going to hate me. So thank you for, thank you for your, your horrible emails. I, I appreciate it. And whether they're good or bad, whether they're good or bad, they help me. You know, that's just the attitude you got to have, right? In a ministry, you got to be like an elephant. you got to have thick skin and a big heart. And uh, so anyway, so you come to what Abraham did, he started giving glory to God. One of the ways we give, we give glory to God is when we praise him. And so having an active praise life, spending time praising God is so healthy for you. Why? Because it's taking the attention off you and your problems and you start worshiping God. You start saying, God, you're a good, good God. You got good plans for me. You, you start singing how, you know, there's not, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You start praising God and what happens is you start to magnify the Lord. Now magnifying the Lord is not about making God bigger. You can't make him any bigger, but you're making him bigger in your inner soul, right? It's, you're getting a bigger picture. All of this, you start to praise him because the Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. That's how you get into the presence of God. When you're whining and complaining and murmuring and cynical and negative, the snakes can get you. It's in the Bible, right? When they were in the wilderness, they were murmuring, complaining against Moses that a bunch of snakes came and started to bite the people. And what's that a picture of? And in, in Corinthians, it says that the destroyer came among them. In other words, when you're negative and you're critical and you're just a cantankerous, horrible person to be around, you start destroying the relationships around you. You know what? You're just taking the attention off of God and you, you are robbing yourself from experience God's presence. But when you're thankful... Come on, when you're thankful, when you're grateful, and you start to remember, God, you know, you, you might be going through the valley right now, but you lift your hands and you start praising God, I thank you. I remember that time when I felt, when I was, uh, that the attack was going on in my life, but you saw me through that. God, I thank you. You start rehearsing past victories. God, I thank you what you did for me. I thank you for my spouse. I thank you for my kids, God. I thank you for my family. God, I thank you for what you're doing in my life. I thank you that, that, that I am complete in Christ. There's there's nothing lacking. No, you start praising God. And what are you doing is you're entering into a different environment. You're leaving the environment of the natural and you're stepping into God's presence, which is fullness of joy. Come on. All of a sudden, everything begins to live. So praise, well, God says, praise me. It's not because he's, he's sensitive and he's, he's got insecurities. You need to praise me. I need, I need to feel important. No, because God knows that what will come out of your life when you start to praise him. I, I heard a great testimony this week. I never asked him for permission, so I won't say who it was. But he told me he was battling all kinds of anxieties. His first Sunday, he sat in the parking lot crying for 45 minutes, never been to church, never been to church in his life. And I said, what got you the most? And he said, it was the music, the worship. And he said, man, I said, I remember that Sunday, I just started, I'm just going to start praising and worshiping God. And man, it just started to come out of me. I'm crying out to God and God met me. And my anxiety, the more I worship and praise, the more my anxiety goes less and less and less and less and less. Come on, because God, God lives in the presence, you know, listen, God indwells our praises. So we ought to be a praising people. Well, I'm just an honest person, and uh, if I don't feel like it, I'm not going to do it. It's a lot of things I don't feel like doing, but I do it anyway because I'm a man. <laughs> Come on, somebody shout! <laughs> We've got a this weak generation, a bunch of sissies in the church. It's time to be a man or a woman of God. Rise up and praise him because God's worthy. That's it. And show up on time. Why show up on time? Because you're a believer and God matters to you. That's why. 
<laughs> What'd you put in my water? <laughs> all right, growing faith. So growing faith is all about what, what are you looking at? All right, so what did Abraham, Abraham didn't look at his 100-year-old body or Sarah's 90-year-old body, but he started to give glory to God and what, he was fully assured that what God, he, oh, see, this is the thing. This is where the, your faith is connected to your understanding of who God is. Because when you know who God is, that unlocks great faith. Great faith comes from a great revelation of Jesus. And so, in other words, he started to glory, put his confidence in God. What do you know about God? He's, God promised me, so shall your descendants be. And what God has promised, he's able to perform. All right, remember that thought. We're going to come around that. Let's go to the next level. So we went from little faith to growing faith. Now we're going to great faith. All right, so let's see what that is. Turn to Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 10. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with them, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word. Stop right there. All right, I love this. But only speak a word. Doesn't this remind you about Peter? Peter said the same thing. Lord, command me. I just need a word from God. And so, this man says the same thing. Only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For Now, notice this. Now, his faith is based on his understanding on who Jesus is. And so, he understands that Jesus has authority. He says, because I also am a man under authority. Having soldiers unto me, I say to this one, go. And he goes. To another, come. And he comes. To another of my servant, do this. And he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. And he said to those who followed, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Okay, little faith is dominated or distracted by the externals and my feelings, my senses. So what is great faith? Great faith is dominated by one thing, God's Word only. Faith only requires God's Word as the ultimate evidence. And so in other words, whether I feel it or not, you know, sometimes we want to put out a fleece. You know, God, if it rains on Monday and Wednesday and lightning on Friday, then I'll take that as an act of faith. No, 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 we don't do fleeces because we got the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit came into the church, there was no more fleeces. So you don't need to put fleeces out. That's not New Testament. So what do you do is you, you let God speak to you with a promise, and then you focus on that promise, and you take God at His Word. So great faith is being Word-governed. I got a promise on it. Abraham, he said, so shall your descendants be. And so he didn't consider his body, but has put his faith in God's promise. Are you hearing me today? So that is, so little faith is sense-ruled. Great faith is resting in a revelation knowledge of God. You know, the other time that Jesus marveled, is found in Mark chapter 6, when he comes to his own hometown, and it says he, and then it, it says the, the people looked at him and said, wait, we know this Jesus. You know, they, they were with him in Jerusalem, saw him working miracles. But when he comes to his own hometown, they were so familiar with him. Come on, we know Jesus. We know his mother. We know his brothers, sisters. They live here. Come on, we used to buy our tables from Jesus when he was running his dad's carpentry shop, you know. And so, so they, and it says, and they were offended at him. And then it says that Jesus could not do, in verse 6, could not do. Everyone say could not. It didn't say that Jesus would not. It said that he could not. Everyone say could not. That's a shocking thing. Your unbelief, hardness of heart, can stop God from working in your life. It said he could not do any mighty miracles there, except he laid his hands on a few sick folk, and he marveled at their unbelief. So there's two places Jesus marveled. Um, how many think God wants us, God wants to marvel at our unbelief or our faith? Okay, six of you got it right. The rest of you are still undecided. Don't worry, I'm going to move, I'm gonna move, you, move you forward. All right, so, but isn't that amazing that God, Jesus marveled? And here he marveled at this man. And what I like about this was this man was an outsider. He was a Roman centurion, and Jesus marveled at his faith. And why, where did this man get his faith? 
he understood something about Jesus that even the people in Jesus' hometown couldn't understand. They couldn't see. They knew him as that. You know, and people can look at you, your friends get around you, and you've received Christ, and they know you from your past. And they're like, you a Christian? Anthony, you a pastor? I remember when you broke into the school in Cranbrook, and you guys hung, you painted 666 on that, v, on that v, Volks, Volkswagen bug, and you put a tail on it, and you called it the beast, and you hung it from the gymnasium. Uh, by the way, this is just a makeup story. This never really happened. <laughs> you know, and they, they look at you, and so, but they get familiar with your reputation, but they don't see what you carry on the inside. Because if you accept a good man in the name of a good man, you get a good man's reward. And if you accept a, a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. And so if you accept Jesus as the carpenter, you might get a table. But if you accept Jesus as the Son of God, as a person of authority, if your insight, if your revelation knowledge, if your understanding of who he is begins to come from a place of revelation, then you can begin to experience the supernatural manifestation. Anywhere in your life where you don't have revelation of God's word, Satan can have a heyday with your life. Oh, that's going. All right. So that's great faith. Let's get to the last, last one. Tested faith. Oh, and I like this one. I'm going to go back to with Abraham. Abraham, 25 years, he believed God for a son. God gave him a promise. God cut a covenant with him. Still no manifestation for 25 years. Man, if I go to the Starbucks and they take more than four minutes to get my drink, I'm driving away, man. I was like, I can't put it in the microwave and get it heated up in 30 seconds. Come on. We can be so impatient. Abraham, 25 years and partway through, God says, I'm going to change your name. From now on, your name is father of many nations, father of a multitude. Could you imagine that Sarah, her name became, you know, she changed the name from Sarah to, from Sarai to Sarah. I mean, he must, people must have thought he was crazy. From now on, call me father of many nations. Father of many nations, supper time. <laughs> father of many nations, bring the donkeys in. It's time, you know. <laughs> it's an old man, a hundred years old. But he's, God is preparing him. Don't give up on your dream. Hold still. And finally, he has this son, Isaac. He has his Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Everything has been believing God for 25 years. And Sarah has a miracle. And God says to him this in Genesis 22. Came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, take now your son. Your only son, the son that you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, catch this. Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we will come back to you. Abra I mean, first of all, this is the first mention of worship in the Bible. And it was costly. It was something that Abraham had believed God for 25 years. And now it, at this point, he's probably about 13 years of age. So for 38 years, it's a whole story, and God says to him, I want you to offer him, give him back to me, burnt sacrifice, take him on the mountain, sacrifice him to me. And Abraham says to the lads, you guys, young men, you guys stay here. The lad and I, we're going to worship, and we are coming back. Abraham knew something about God. He said, God is a giver and not a taker. And if God has promised something over my life, 
There's no take, he's not taking it back. He's not, if God said that he's giving me a son and in him, you know, shall your descendants be, then that boy is coming back. He understood that God was a miracle worker, that God cannot lie, and that if God needed to raise him from the dead, that's what God would do because the promise was made that in Isaac would be the, his, the heir of the promise. The highest voice of faith Little faith says, I think God can. Great faith says, I know God will. But tested faith says, it's already been done in Christ. Where's your level of faith? Because here's what I'm convinced, that God wants us to go step by step. Maybe you've got an error in your life right now where you've got little faith. Can I just encourage you to start feeding your faith and starving your fear? Because when you feed your faith, your fear is going to go on a diet and get really skinny and hopefully die. And hopefully it will die the death of a thousand screams. But if you feed your fears and your anxieties and your worries, your faith will grow weaker and weaker and weaker. So, what's the, the solution? Focus. Be single-minded. I I'm a follower of Jesus. I take God at his word and I live by faith and not by reason. And I believe for God's super to be on every area of my natural. Can I hear a good amen?